And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the temple. In the red, in the red corner, co we have Dario Pesce. Yeah. And in and in the blue corner we have Francesco Dino Lucenti. Hey I'm, everybody. I'm hoping I got both of your names right. The double headed monster of Lightfish Games and creation and creators of the five E powered sci fi RPG Farsight. How you how you two doing today? Great, we're happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Happy to ha happy to have you on. Um now I um Whenever I have, whenever I have a pair, I some I sometimes ask who's the abbot and who's the Costello, but that's, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I can't. I remember, I remember hearing that. Th I remember hearing that there was a equivalent when it came to when it came to physical comedy. I just can't remember the name. Um, there, there was a certain there was a certain style of com of comedian back in the day that what that that um was watched by a lot of kids that <laughs> that was on the physical end of things, but no but nothing da nothing damaging. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I just and it was brought. It was brought up when I did the interview on Bron Colonia, but I just the name currently escapes me. <laughs> well, just let's say he Dario is like the the technical the guy. guy. Yeah, yeah the guy. <laughs> he's the engineer behind uh, this this ship, mm -hmm. and I'm just the the crazy guy who pushes random button on the. On the console, you know. Yeah, you are the lore guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, but I. So, one of the traditions around here is the origin story when it comes to RPGs. So, with that in mind, I'd like you guys to. I'd like you both to walk me through um, how you got into role playing games and what was it that made it stick. Oh man. Um, that's a long story. Yeah, <laughs> it usually is. Yeah, of course. Well, uh, I started playing, I think, when I was 18. So not very, very, very um, small kid. I was, uh, I think, in middle school. And I started with uh, a bunch of my friends. Um, uh, and it sticks. <laughs> I think uh, it is one of the things uh, that I'm, I, I've done and I'm doing. I, I think I, I will do for the rest of my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, actually, I think I started role playing the first time I picked up a stick from the ground and saw a sword, you know, <laughs> and, and it sticked to me from that moment on. I mean, Chasing stories, making up new worlds. Uh, uh, for the same reason, I, I like reading. You know, it's it gives you the opportunity to meet a lot of people that you could never meet in a lifetime. See a lot of places uh, you could never go. With, and that's the reason I and I do it every day. I mean, not only at the table, but also in very different you know context. And it's just a piece of me and of the way I live every day. Such an important part, you know, just seeing reality through different eyes and different characters, also. Mm -hmm. Now, th now that brings that brings me to. Um, f first off, how, first off, um, how did you, how did you two meet up? Were, is it a case where you guys have been mutual troublemakers for the longest time? <laughs> Actually, we, we, we were doing something totally different from gaming when we met. Mm -hmm. We were into music at the time, and we were in a youth association. So we had this project to come up with a rehearsal room for emerging artists and young people. Um, and we had this project. I mean, we, we get to know each other. He was the kind of the metalhead, and yeah. I was kind of the punk. You know, mm -hmm. I was doing mostly punk and rap in that moment. And uh, yeah, we got together and we said, hey, let's do this for the 
for crazy people like us that need a place to to meet and to do something different. And then it just, you know, that project, we were able to to realize it, that, the, I mean, the rehearsal room still, still lives. Obviously, other people followed us. And we moved to other other worlds, more, uh, <laughs> let's say, mental, less physical. Mm-hmm. Oh. This, yeah, when you, when at, you one mentioned... point, at one point, we started play together. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and then uh, I was... Uh, I was already uh, working on a little project, uh, and uh, one day I I said, "Hey Francesco, <laughs> do you want to work with me at, on a game?" And all has started. Yeah, obviously I said yes, like I said to every like every ten projects I start in a day. You know, I'm the kind of guy who <laughs> starts uh, several different things but doesn't actually end up doing anything i mean finishing anything but fortunately dario is on the other side of the team and he's like he sticks to one thing and brings it and he would never finish it he just keeps on working on it you know and yeah. he keeps on adding new stuff and uh, refining it and while i'm already working on something different and i come back from time to time bringing new ideas and this synergy that created was able i mean it, it is uh, mm, the founding energy of uh, of our project, mm-hmm. and now with with that with that kind of, I will admit when 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 um when when, when you had mentioned uh, being a metalhead, I meet for some for some reason if if um if someone plays word association when it comes to metal and Italy, um my mind always goes to Luca Torelli. Yeah, <laughs> the Rhapsody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, also, if I remember, I don't know if you know um, Lacuna Coil. Yeah. It's another metal band, mm-hmm. Italian metal band. But we we had a, a very good scene some some years ago. Now, yeah, it's not like uh, when I was playing in uh, in a band. Although it's. Um, there was it's more on the rock side now. Yeah, there was um, there was one, there was one, gr- there was one group that came that came out of left field, did a couple albums, and then di- and then disappeared. Um, that I that I liked, um, and that was um, Vinterblot. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know if Ooh, I, I can best des- I can best describe as Italian Vikings. <laughs> yeah but actually you know the cool thing is that a lot of people that have been playing when we were young actually ended up in this gaming hobby later i mean we met what was it the guy from aces games dario mm-hmm. and i was yeah. wearing like um a hoodie with written venice hardcore and it's a hoodie that comes from a festival we have here in venice and he said hey you guys listen to hardcore you know i'm into that kind of shit too oh let's do some uh, and it's actually amazing how music and rpgs and gaming overall it's really really connected around here i oh, um, yes one one of my de- one of my dear um tabletop friends who i'm going to be talking with concerning his new project in about a week um gavriel kirioga over in over in argentina he um he does a lot he does a lot of that integration to the point where he'll mm. he'll have he'll have he'll have his own he'll have his own playlist and even get and even get some music done for um the games that he's made. Um, but it's oh, not man. it's not that project that is in Kickstarter in these days, right? It's not that one. Um, Hell Knight, yeah, that one. Yeah, ah, that one. I knew it. I saw it. That's cool. Mm. But it, it's something really. I think it's very energizing. I mean, you you have all this musical fuel for your imagination and all these emotions that you can transpose into gaming that is amazing i mean the other guys who did something like that was uh mork bjork the guys from free Liga, you know um, they are all infused with that black doom metal mood uh, and mm, i think it's cool i mean i love music and uh, it feeds me also also for first sight i've listened to a lot of different music while writing uh, and making up, coming up with new worlds. Yeah. Um, hold on one moment. Um, it is funny you mentioned going th- going through a bunch of a bunch of different music 
when it came when it comes to writing because I needed to I needed to have I I wanted to have a ultimate playlist for any fantasy game that I was that I was doing. I figured mm-hmm. I'd end up making an hour of field music and an hour of battle music. Well, not making, but picking <laughs> from for a playlist. Yeah. I ended up with 26 hours of music. <laughs> <laughs> 26 hours divided oh, yeah. in, divided into divided into 13 themes, each with an hour of field music and an hour of combat music from all over the place. Some of it some of it is from various films, some of it is from games, some of it is yeah, yeah. some of it is um is we- is weird stuff like the like the stuff that Philip Glass was doing for the Katsi movies. Mm-hmm. And some of it is from some of it is from Godzilla. <laughs> Which one? Um a few of the tracks that I used were from Tokyo SOS. Okay. Um I didn't use I didn't use any fr- I didn't use any from the last few films if if that's what you, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was that was the question. <laughs> no. Well, while there's some tracks in those films that I liked, it I was with each of them I was looking for a specific theme. Mm-hmm. Some th- some themes were harder than others. Um Now, obviously Farsight is 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 a science fiction project that's leaning far more into the realm of space opera. Um, yeah. So I'd be I'd be curious what your guys' background is when it comes to science fiction. Oh, are you sure, Dario? I mean, you have a quite a background. Okay, well, uh, actually, just today I finished reading the the Fading Suns trilogy by Cherry. Uh-huh. Where uh, it's from the seventies. I'm kind. I really dig the old school stuff and hard science fiction. I got, for example, Stephen Baxter on my <laughs> beside my bed. I need to start with Ring and Infinitus. I of obviously Asimov, the Foundation. We're both big fans mm-hmm. of the whole Foundation cycle. Um, what else? All other work of Asimov. Yeah. Um... But also, you know, some kind of a more strange stuff. I really like also Ballard, Dick, and uh, also the whole Bizarro movement from Portland um, of the last 20 years. Yeah. I read a lot of Carlton Malik and stuff like that. Uh, did, so I tried to... Hmm? Did you ever Did you ever read Bradbury's work? Uh, you mean Bradbury? Uh, actually not. I, I think not. I... I know, of course, Bradbury, mm. but I don't remember if I read something. Um, let me see. Obviously, Probably. his big claim to fame is the Martian Chronicles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have in my in my to do list for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's fun. It's funny you mention um, Foundation, given given there's some there's some pr- there's been some pretty good audio dramas of. Um, of foundation done by the BBC, done by the BBC, and um, well, the on, the only the only real critique the only real critique or issue that I had with, that I had with foundation is um, Asimov kind of wrote himself into a corner. And I think I think the re- I think the reason why after why after a while he ended up doing just prequel stuff was, according to his wife, he did, he couldn't figure out where to, where to continue the story. Oh. Mm-hmm. And I partially blame I'm... it on the fact of tr- of trying to com- of trying to trying trying to combine robots, empire, and foundation into into one whole. Yeah, but um, from uh, from what I know, uh, Asimov um, considered the trilogy finished finished in uh, with the original three big books. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, the um, the original trilogy of the foundation all that came uh, after was because uh, uh, his fan wanted him to do it so a lot of year later he uh, come back to the foundation universe to uh, to write uh, uh, the um, i don't know the the prequels and then the two book after the uh, the original trilogy. So, 
I mean, I think it's quite difficult to come back uh, to a work uh, you did, uh, I don't know, 30 years uh, before, you know. Mm -hmm. So I consider the, um, um, the original trilogy one of the best work of, uh, of Asimov. Yeah. And then a lot of... I, I like also the prequel and, um, and the sequel, but uh, there are other works of uh, Asimov that I really like. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, The God Himself. Mm -hmm. Did you read it? A long time ago, but yeah. So, yeah, Asimov... In, that's that's the one with the aliens, right, Dario? Uh, because yeah. I haven't read that. Mm -hmm. I think the only one with aliens had uh, from Asimov. Yeah, aliens was not something that was not something that he did a whole no. that he did a whole lot. But um, it was it was a um, a choice because uh, from what I know, I mean, um, in the in the beginning of his career. He wanted to to, in, uh, to insert uh, a bunch of aliens in uh, in the also in the um, in the foundation uh, universe, but uh, it was his publisher that uh, wanted the aliens to be uh, uh, less than a human, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And Asimov don't wanted it. So he preferred to not insert any alien in uh, in his book. Mm -hmm. And they are really conceptual alien. We had this challenge also while working on Farsight, right? Uh, when you want to come up with an alien species, I mean, with an alien, uh, you want it to be really, really alien. You want it to be something from outer space. Mm -hmm. But when, when you come to gaming, it... it we're not sure it's the right choice, at least for starters. Uh, um, then we had the really weird stuff also during our Kickstarter campaign, and we'll have some bonus, you know, species and playable, um, yeah, playable stuff that is really strange. Uh, but the main course of uh, our game is mainly humanoids, and uh, although they have quite, we are, we have worked a lot on their culture. Mm -hmm. more than on their physique or um how can you say the um, yeah their capabilities mm -hmm. because if you give something too much powerful or too much uh, you, you know that interacts with the with the world in a way that is too different and too alien from what you're used to it can be challenging to play mm -hmm. yeah uh, We've put that too, of course. <laughs> we have also robots. Of course, you can play robots, uh, but it's not the first choice. Yeah. We. And when it, I've always, I've always held, I've always held the philosophy that um, when de when developing an a when developing an alien species in science fiction. There, there's one of two unwritten rules that you should that you should ideally follow, uh, one following the other. The first is having some kind of Earth analog. Mm -hmm. um, mm. whether, whether it whether it be a, whether it be a species based on, um, that's that can be lo that can be loosely seen as similar to to some to some sort of flora or fauna nat native to Earth, or a or a if you can, or barring that, a re, a reason for it doing what it does, um, or at the or at the very least at the very least being presented in a way that make that makes a degree of sense. Um, I agree. Now, with now with that in, with that in mind, I I will note that when I look through when I look through the quick start folder on the Kickstarter page, I did get a laugh at somebody putting it putting a fan entry of Vogons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, because uh, we I think we all like the uh, the guide, mm -hmm. the only guide. <laughs> yeah, uh, and ju and just the work as a whole of D of Douglas Adams. 
Um, yeah, of just course. Don't, just don't play the PC game unless you're in the mood for suffering. I really <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a game. Yeah. <laughs> there was there was a there was a te there was a te this this was in the days of text adventure games. Mm -hmm. Um it is it is very it is very it is very clearly made by somebody who wants who, who wanted people to suffer through it. <laughs> um I wouldn't say it's as infamous as I have no mouth and I must scream, but that's a very special set of circumstances. <laughs> but if you, but the wrong decision, could, the wrong decision could lo could um lock you in the story, and you'd have to start from scratch. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those. I like to call this kind of process hand breaking, the polar opposite of hand holding. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Right. But shifting to mechanics a bit, mm -hmm. you guys, ha you guys have referred to what to the system that you're using, um, Five E Evolved. And yeah. one it's of the a strange name, I know. Um, <laughs> well, I, I would say it's a strange name, but then, but then, but then I've got um, then I've then I've got then I've got the dark I've got the dark destiny system to to contend with from from Luca, so I can't say I can't say it's all that strange. Oh, um, and there's. There's been there's been there's been interesting things that have shown that have shown up in the temple when it comes to when it comes to design. Um some and of course some of them not even using dice. Hi Amber. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when it comes to when it, the first thing that I the first thing that I think a lot of people are going to notice about it be about the concept of 5e evolved is mm -hmm. the fact that you're not using the d20 system. You are giving life to the lonely D twelve by doing a two D twelve system. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I think that's just the surface of it. Five E evolved. Um, I think just to get you into the context of everything, uh, it, we need to get back to the first question. You one of the first questions you came up with, which was. Uh, when you guys started playing and everything, mm -hmm. um, we actually all started around the 3.5 of D and D uh, when we were, I mean, teenagers. Ah, uh, yeah, the and, trap era. Huh? Yeah, exactly. We, we started with that, uh, but we got we started playing me and Dagio. So we started with 3.5 with different groups, mm -hmm. but we met in when five uh, when the fifth edition came out, mm -hmm. and we started playing that. I, I started play I got back into role playing after a long period of non gaming, and I said, oh, "Hey, this thing works. It's more elegant. It's uh, I like the feeling I have when I'm around the table. It's it's something different." And we started not from um, not really from those mechanics, uh, but we wanted to bring back that that feeling, that easiness of use, that elegance of uh, mechanisms. So. We started thinking about how to recreate it, obviously in a science fiction context, which was, uh, you know, mm, which um, it was mandatory to do something different. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. we, uh, we could we not work. Out, with, yeah, yeah, we figured it out that uh, there there was no no good way to uh, bring the fifth edition in in its entirety in its mm, as it is in the science fiction world i think uh, exactly we never never ever wanted to play dungeons and dragons in space that was not no we are we already exactly. have that it's called spell jammer <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly uh, but what what we liked what we like uh, uh, of dnd is uh, as francesco said um, the the overall mood Okay, of the mechanics, uh, the overall dynamics at the table. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to preserve that, and uh, but the D twenty mechanics, the 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 basic D twenty role of D and D, was a little bit, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, help me, uh, Francesco, um, monotonous. Yeah, it was in something already seen. Plus, let's talk about the D12. Mm -hmm. The D12 is cool. I mean, we both sat I, around the table. Okay. The D12 well, gets the D12 gets have, gets 
vastly overlooked by by a lot of by a lot of games and a lot of designers. Exactly. And I um exactly. I had I had I, n I never was able to finish it because I wasn't able to get the script down satisfactorily, but I had considered doing a, doing a parody vi video um bas basically basically mocking those those um those adopt an animal sa sad ads <laughs> uh, about saying for for just 5 cents a day you too can adopt a D12 and get it a good home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's the point. <laughs> and it's I don't know. It's a very, very beautiful dice. Is, is I think, uh, for my taste, it is visually the 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 most beautiful die that is well. Oh, it's certainly so, the least painful. That's going to be D fours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. It's a caltrop. <laughs> it's not a <laughs> dice. <laughs> Then we wanted, you know, two dice is better than one. I mean, uh, we we both play also war games like, uh, I mean, Warhammer or other board games, and we like throwing the chuck and dices. We like throwing a lot yeah. of dice. So two but... is obviously better than one. Well, if you like yeah, throwing dice, course. I'm guessing you've played Shadowrun a few times. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but there is there is there is also um, uh, I think a probability reason because. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, rolling two dice is very different from rolling one die. Oh yeah. Uh, and I wanted to insert uh, to to bring in the I think in in the five E context mm -hmm. um, a basic roll that was uh, more um, predictable in some way, uh, but uh, that uh, brings. A dynamic, a, a more dynamic um, uh, outcome. So, because when you have two dice, you have the two results, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. the um, the result of the roll. Uh, yeah, the double fumble, mm -hmm. the double double one. Yeah. yeah, you have you have the 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 result of the check that is the sum of the two, and of course the um, the bonus that um, of your character, but mm -hmm. you have also the two partial result, and with that you can play in the mechanics. And I did the, did it with uh, a bunch. Um, um, I'm sorry, my English is a little bit rusty. <laughs> um, with a, a special result mechanic that uh, brings uh, a lot of variety resp uh, with respect uh, to D and D. Mm -hmm. So you do not have only the critical hit on uh, uh, on combat, but you have uh, a lot of different uh, uh, possibilities with the special result. Uh, also, in, in in any checks, you your character uh, can do. Yeah, we got this whole like mm, nar narrative thing. Uh, like you you have a special result. And uh, it, something happens like, uh, yes, you have a success and, or uh, you have a bad result in, uh, you have a success, but. So it gives also, you know, um, some, um, some, you know, some material to the, to the GM or to the players to come up with uh, uh, elements, narrative elements that can enrich the whole storytelling around the table. And with that idea because we didn't want it you know a, a special hit or a bonus uh, which was merely you know statistics and uh, arithmetics with a bonus with in fight we wanted something that can move around the table that can create mm -hmm. um stories events that can change how how things evolve during a fight uh, and we used uh, this whole idea of design also with cards uh, mm -hmm. i play a lot of board games and so we we saw the whole five um, five e idea of inspiration. Is it called inspiration in English? Mm. Yeah, uh, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, you know that point you get, and you can use it to get what is it? Uh, a special success on a roll. So on a roll, exactly, and it bounces back. You know, I do something that is good role playing, my and my GM 
awards me with something that bounces back into combat. Mm. We, we wanted something that moved. I mean, I um, engage into the story. I invest into role playing. I want something that rewards me with more story, with more uh, power on the events, mm -hmm. not with just a mere bonus uh, during combat. Because that's, I mean, it might not be the point of, uh, of my session, of my gaming session. I mean, actually, combat is quite lethal in Farsight, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, whenever, I, sh I should note that whenever I, whenever I see people um, go away from a single die into, into some sort of multi-die roll, uh, one of the big reasons that they end up doing that, oddly enough, is the bell curve. And just, to, mm -hmm. just as a bit of an experiment, I loaded up, um, I loaded up 2d12 on any dice, is a very good um, die probability cal calculator site, um, and the uh, me the um, the mean result is is get is going to be thir is going to be thirteen since there's a yeah. um, eight point three percent of for that. And exactly. Yeah. So the the big as a d twenty has a flat five percent for everything. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, which, exactly. Oddly enough, can make can sometimes make die results feel kind of swingy, whereas a a um doing two d ten or in some games or two d twelve and in the in this um you end up with you end up with with die results that are going to lean more towards the middle and mm -hmm. the idea the idea of botching or the idea of cr of critting is far is far less co is far less common. Yeah, but I um, uh, in first sight there is um, uh, the mechanic I was talking uh, before, mm -hmm. the special result mechanics, mm -hmm. rely on the result of the single die, yeah. not the uh, wall results. So, yeah, you have uh, a bell probability on the um, total result of the um, uh, of the roll, but the Special result, good or bad, mm -hmm. uh, are on the single die. So you have uh, a much bigger probability in foresight with respect to D and D of uh, uh, making some stuff <laughs> during your check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's I um I suppose I suppose it would be appropriate to call it the but and. Yeah. Oh. In a way. Mm -hmm. Now, I would like to I would like to speak a bit on um, on char on character creation, since mm -hmm. you, since um it's it's talked about you you've talked about going f going fully um going fully customizable. So, mm -hmm. and as far as far as as far as I'm aware, you only have you only have um three. You only have three outright classes. Yes. Um. Mm. Now, so what I'm what I'm curious what I'm curious about is when it comes to when it comes to class design, um, how similar and how different would it would it be compared to say vanilla Five E? I think this is one of the biggest difference from D and D because, um, so. The um, in say in sci-fi you don't have the same uh, uh, big uh, uh, archetypes of characters that there is in fantasy. You don't have the barbarian, the warrior, the the thief. You have a lot, a lot of character you can create uh, uh, that are that have not specific limits. In mm -hmm. what they can do, so we decided to opt for a system. Um, so we have three classes. We call them classes because class is a term that um, everyone knows, you know. But they are um, somewhat. Uh, um, Help me, Francesco. Um, yeah, they represent just different approaches, exactly, to, yeah. to the game. To, to, yeah. to 
to reality, I mean, exactly. and to the game from a mechanic point of view and from an interactive point of view. Exactly. But uh, each one of the classes can be anything because you create your character uh, choosing uh, skills, talents, um, various uh, features. Yeah. You can the whole choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like now, the whole idea of our site is not, um, I mean, to enjoy it to the fullest, uh, you have to play a long campaign. It's one of those enormous space opera long campaign games that last years with your gaming group. And we wanted um, not, obviously can play one shot, but that's not the point. We wanted to create, um, to give the freedom to the players to evolve their character in each way they, they they would desire, or in each way the story would uh, would push them to do. Uh, so you can have, uh, for example, mm, and uh, uh, just let me do one step backwards. And we don't want to, um, you know, put them on a railroad and tell them, you know, you have to do this. You'll do this for the rest of the game at level dot five. You take. Uh, that talent which allows you in combos with that thing. We want it. It's more sandbox feeling mm -hmm. uh, for side. You you start with some talents which are not really mm, binding. We had, for example, we have three classes, as Dario said, Sigma, Delta, and Psy. Mm -hmm. we, we decided to choose letters exactly also to give that sense of abstract idea more than... Um, of something that you know mm, or something concrete mm -hmm. uh, something and so uh, first of all we have Pigma which is kind of the technical guy the guy who knows how to do things the skill monkey. Um, yeah. the skill the exactly the, the yeah the reliable one I, I, I dare say because the the so each classes have uh, some a bunch of basic uh, uh, capabilities that are different, of mm -hmm. course, and um, and these capabilities changes the way you mm -hmm. uh, you approach the game and the way you use each one of the talent of your of the future talent of mm -hmm. the of your uh, character. Uh, but... So sig the sigma can manipulate the dice. So. Some of uh, of its um, feet, let me say, um, uh, can so the 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 player can decide. Let me let me say to success when it's needed. Mm -hmm. If I want, if you know what I mean. Uh, so it's the reliable one. Mm -hmm. The delta instead is the action yeah. one. So it's more or less similar to the uh, to the warrior of the mm -hmm. fighter but it's not a fighter on its own it can be the action the action man but come si dice non per forza in combat yeah not necessarily in combat it's just a very yeah. proactive way of uh, of interacting with the game while uh, exactly. you can say the sigma is more tactical he sees the situation and you know, places one of two uh, good shots straight in where it's needed. The Delta is more like always moving, does a lot of actions, keeps on interacting and uh, very dynamical, very energetic. And then you have the Psy, which actually interacts with the reality itself. Yeah. But this doesn't really bind you to do some just one thing. For example, uh, during the first sessions, uh, the, during the first play tests, we have one guy, uh, a friend of us, who came up with the idea of doing, uh, hey, I want to do a sniper, right? Uh, but I don't want to play a fighter. I don't want to be a proactive sniper. Can I play the Sigma, so the guys who know how to do stuff, who manipulates dices, and be a sniper? And we said, Man, you're a genius. That works great. I mean, you just you're not really into fight. Maybe you stand outside, you aim, but when you shoot that one shot, you're sure that it hits the spot. 
On the other hand, I was trying to, to I was playing the Psy and I decided, hey, I don't want to play the Psy, you know, the classical uh, backline um, support or Wait, caster. Yeah. yeah, you know, I want I want to play a fighter. I want to play a Psy fighter. So it took all those powers and talents, which gave me a lot of mobility. And I was able to, um, I was just, you know, a clean hands fighter, like a monk, but I was teleporting from one side to the other, sort of like a night crawler mm -hmm. from the X-Men. Mm -hmm. And and you can do that in first sight. You can do that yeah. and you can start. And that's just the beginning. You start from that idea and then you evolve uh, with different talents and you can pick from different tech trees. At a certain point, you say, hey, I want that Delta talent mm -hmm. because it works good for me. Uh, you can take it. You spend more points, but you can take it. Mm -hmm. And it really gives you great freedom. It's one you need to have patience. You know, it's not uh, it's not really easy for entry levels because you got to read a lot of stuff. You got a lot of talents to choose from. You got a lot. I mean, and to do something really that you want to, no. you've got to you've not, got to read. So you you have to come up with your concept for mm -hmm. the character and not rely on a concept that you find on the book, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And yeah, another, exactly. thing, another thing you can do with Farsight that is not very easy, or let me say impossible with D&D, is do a character that is far, far, far away from combat. So in D&D, each character you do have something to do with combat mm -hmm. exactly. but in in foresight if you uh, for example if you want to do a scientist you can do a scientist that do not know how to handle uh you know so a handgun if you want to so that is Uh, che non è continua tu Francesco perché mi sono impapinato yeah and, and I mean uh, and you see and it fits perfectly with the whole um, science fiction concept I mean we were playing uh, some playtest at a game con with little kids they were like teenagers from um, grade 7 or 6 and uh, one of them was the scientist they were playing this like uh, exploration team uh, on the surface of a wild uh, alien planet and they had to pick up stuff and study new alien species so totally explorative i mean mm, and the scientist which was the leader of course of the whole party was like no man we got to get those samples we got to study these animals no you shooter don't shoot them they're living creatures we got to uh, you know mm, Uh, we need to study them. We're here for something different. And it, it was perfect. It was perfect, you know, and you can do that. Mm -hmm. And we have a system. That we, we came up with, uh, with something that allows you to, to do that and to do that while having fun, of course, while giving you engaging mechanics. Yeah. Mm. Right. It's not something that you, do, that you do just with the role playing. You do it with your talents. You do it with the things that you have put into your character and with tools we give you. But they're not tools that define what you have to do. They're just, um, they give you more opportunities to interact. Mm -hmm. They don't define the way to ha that you have to roll, which I think was, it's a very important thing. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one, of the key, one of the key things that I, de that I definitely noticed just, lo just looking at the way character sheets are set up is the fact that the the whole the whole proficiency modifier approach mm -hmm. is not present here you guys are you guys are going right back to good old skill points yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i tried to use the the proficiency bonus like in dd but it was um a little uh, all the same you know what i mean yeah it was not very customizable if so i prefer to use uh, uh, <laughs> the old fashioned uh, um skill points mm -hmm. so you can you can uh come si dice distribuire francesco uh, you can yeah distribute <laughs> them 
you can put them yeah. the, the way you want. You can, uh, you're not really just focusing on one thing. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the other, um, and of course, the other major thing is the fact that you guys added another, ab another ability score instead of sticking with the basic six. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, yeah, and, the that and, getting, is, and, and getting rid of the uh, whole ability score and just going straight with the modifiers a la yeah, 20. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. So the, the ability mm, score are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Some are the same of DAD, like dexterity, uh, but we um, reorganized them so uh, to make the game a little bit, uh, a little more balanced. So, uh, for example, in D&D, &D, uh, or, or better, in, in the 5e D&D, &D, dexterity is the, the, the king of yeah, the... Yeah, it's the god stat. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's the god stats. Okay. So, in first sight, I wanted to, uh, to give uh, each one of the ability score more or less the same uh, importance in the game. Mm -hmm. So I decided to, for example, um, uh, create the combativity uh, ability score that uh, encompass all or or a lot of the combat skills and uh, and such. But it's not the only uh, the only ability you rely on when you are in combat because. Mm -hmm. Clarity is also important, but uh, strength is also important, intelligence. So I wanted to um, to give uh, each one of the ability score um, a, come si dice, uno scopo, un, uh, yeah, uh, a purpose. A purpose, a purpose in each. The game. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, another mm, another of those characters in the first uh, playtest was. Uh, you know, like a, a kind of a rocket raccoon guy, okay? He was full of bombs and like to make things explode. And he was actually kind of low in combat stats, but he was really good with, with technical stuff and he was able to throw stuff. He had just that talent to throwing and he was lethal. I mean, he couldn't handle a gun, but he was amazing with grenades and explosives. Mm -hmm. And he had, uh, you know, he had his purpose and his... And it was perfectly tailored role inside the party. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that in with that in mind, um, when it one of the other one of the other things on the on the uh, character on the character sheet that I I could I, that I couldn't help but notice is the is the line between traits and um, and f well it says traits and features but you but on the character sheet it's read as trati and privilege which I'm, guess, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's I'm guessing that's mm -hmm. a um, translation hiccup. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, I don't remember. And uh, I'm not. But is is it a is it a case where um where one where one of them is more inherent and the other one is more is is more is more your um particular picks? Uh, can you please so yeah repeat the question? It, what I'm no, asking is the dividing line between traits and um, f uh, between trati and privilege. And privilege, okay. And privilege. Yeah. So traits, traits are basically what you get from your species, from your backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So inherited uh, things, and then you have uh, the stuff that uh, your class gives to you. So mm -hmm. the the basic. The basic capability I I was uh, talking before, and then you have talents that are let me say uh, something like the subclasses of D and D, okay, mm -hmm. but you can choose freely from them. So you can choose um, well some talent, for example, have uh, a tree structure tr structure. So mm -hmm. um, they have. Um, a bunch of uh, uh, of perks, and you can uh, take the first, then take the second, and so on. Mm -hmm. But if you want, you can take the first one, 
of a talent and the first one of another talent and then you can take the second in one of the two or take a, th a third one so you have uh like if you have a lot of subclasses and you can mix and match them uh uh whatever you want mm -hmm. now when it comes to when it comes to psionics the of I was going to ask if that's exclusive to to peep to psi class characters but given how given what you mentioned about cross classing um it sounds like that it sounds like that's not the case where somebody could yeah, dip the into psi, the psi are the best with the psionic power mm -hmm. but if you want to do for example a delta character that use some psionic power you can do it yeah and what I do think, what I do think, is a bold move on your on your guys's part is to not use psionics as a in, as a reskin of the um, Vancian model that D and D uses. Instead, you guys are going by a point based um, system. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a point based system, and uh, um, we we decided to do uh, different also with the, the power themselves. So uh, in D&D, you have, uh, I don't know, uh, a spell, and a spell do mm -hmm. a thing, you know. So uh, I don't know, fireball, you do fireball, mm -hmm. okay? In Farsight, a single power, or psionic power, is a collection of things you can do. So instead of fireball, you have, uh, let me, uh, if, if, if it was a fantasy, okay, uh, you would have, Pyromancy, and with pyromancy you can do uh, scorching rays, fireball, uh, I don't know, uh, burning hands, and so on. So our psionic power are organized in this way. So you have, I don't know, uh, instill emotion, and with it you can instill fear, you can instill uh, laugh. Uh, you can instill all kind of emotion, and each one of them have a game effect. A different... And it's also, you know, interactive inside of it because you can boost uh, these powers. I mean, uh, you have certain amount of points, and certain powers require a certain amount, but you can boost it with more to make it more powerful. And it's it's really more interactive on in this sense. I mean, it gives you a lot of more freedom and more, um, you know possibilities during of interaction with the game mm -hmm. now when it comes now when it comes to when it comes to it would would it be fair of me to say that the that using psionics is not a fi is not a fire and forget if you're familiar with that um terminology uh not exactly um what does it mean Fire and Forget is considered the second rule of the Vancian model. The idea is, when you cast that spell, it is going to do exactly what it says on the tin every single time. You cannot, you cannot say, you cannot say, shrink down a fireball in order to light a cigarette. A fireball is going to do exactly mm -hmm. what it does: throw, throw, throw it at an area and make the and make those people's lives miserable, or make your yeah. or make your fellow player members miserable. Miserable because <laughs> splash damage. Mm -hmm. Um yes. Whereas if I'm if I'm reading this if I'm reading this right, you would it be fair of me to say that the point system that you have is a it is a case of basic effects as well as putting um secondary effects on psionic effects yeah. at the yes, cost yeah. of spending so, more. So mm -hmm. each 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 power have uh, as I said uh, a bunch of different effects. So there's, of course, some basic effect, and the, and there is some effect that costs uh, some more points, of mm -hmm. course. But each one of of that effect can be incremented with uh, some points, uh, with more points than the, uh, the basic cost. Mm -hmm. And each one have different incrementation different uh, so each power do 
different stuff uh, based on the point you uh, you put on it. So you can, I don't know, uh, continuing to the <laughs> to the fireball example. Uh, in first sight, uh, you would have, um, I don't know, fire blast. Uh, for one side point, uh, you get uh, a little um, sparkle of uh, <laughs> of flame. For two side point, the sparkle is bigger, and for five point, you get the I don't know the the D and D fireball. Mm -hmm. So you can, um, uh, come si dice? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, tipo, it's like point resources. Uh, or resource management, if you want. Yeah, it's like it's more tactical. You know, you don't have to prepare the day before or something, and you know a set of tools that are static, and uh, hopefully you will get to use them. Mm. Uh, you can choose. You know, if you're in a really dangerous situation at the beginning of the session, or you wake up in a tremendous place, you can use them all up to do something really impressive, and just you used up for the whole day. Um, it depends on the situation. It's much more tactical, I think, uh, than using the a system that actually, you know, tells you you have to do this splash damage, three mirror square, and for example, if you if you go for the instill emotion, uh, let's say you want to frighten uh, a four, no, uh, so uh, you can you can uh, instill fear in uh, a target. With one point, mm -hmm. if you but if you uh, spend two point uh, or three, you can uh, you can instill fear in three uh, in three different targets, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it, each each one of the power have a different uh, uh, a different type of uh, incrementation of mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, of things you can do with that power. Yeah, or a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of fear in just one cut target, and perhaps he'll have a yeah. heart attack. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Now, one of the what you had mentioned earlier that um, Farsight is going is going to be is going to have characters that are a bit squishier than some of the than some of the tanky mm -hmm. boys you might see in you might see in Five E. Yeah. Um, what I'm what I'm curious about is 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 um how is how that's manifested. I I did look I did look well, at the fact that the weapons on the sample characters they do a they do a pretty good amount of damage even uh, even those <laughs> technology because technology is a very very uh come si dice um um un livellatore come si dice cioè, it's oh a... dear uh, yeah. <laughs> technology <laughs> it's a serious I mean, <laughs> when you face with stuff like that uh, we had we were thinking about it I mean if you get shot by a rifle it's not like uh, getting an arrow in the knee I mean it's, it's, it's something totally different mm -hmm. and so uh, the weapons that the base that the characters have are the same that the enemies have and they are lethal in the same way they do a lot of damage and because we think that's, you know, realistic in a certain way. Uh, I mean, if you get shot, you you might die. I mean, we're, we're playing with, with a technology that it's very fast forward in the future, which is uh, pretty more lethal than the one we have. Mm -hmm. And we gave... So, and, mm, and we decided to rebalance all the, um, uh, all the combat system because mm -hmm. in the end, when you... When you have high level character or mid yeah. level character, you are the Avengers. So <laughs> <laughs> you are somewhat invincible or or something. Mm -hmm. In in first sight, uh, um, for example, the character um, have a lot less hit points mm -hmm. uh, with the level. So you have a little bit. Uh, more le hit points at first level, but then you get one hit point. Yeah, it flattens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if uh, I don't know, uh, a first a first level character can have between I don't know fifteen and and twenty hit points. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, a 20 level character can have uh, i don't know 30 40 mm-hmm. yeah points. and so, the whole point was you know the by dagger yeah, sorry i don't know why I know the whole point was also you know, this has an impact also on the length of the fight and the way the characters fight. You have we have put a lot of rules for interactions with the with the environment to for cover for um, distance and I mean uh, the fights are not long. I mean we, we never plan to do to come up with a game that has fights a session long. Mm-hmm. We, it, it is something that has to be fast that has to be tactic you need to place yourself in a good spot uh, also because you know a lot of the combat will most probably will be at distance it's not necessary but mm, most of the time it might be mm-hmm. uh, and so you have to inter- interact a lot uh, with the with the environment to get the advantage of the situation because yeah. I mean, guns if you get shot you will go down. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, the other thing that the other thing that I couldn't help but notice is the death threshold rule, which um, is kind, of, which one is feel, feels like it feels like a more deadly version of the old massive damage rule mm-hmm. from th- from three point X. And two, I'm guessing that was that was one of your ways in making combat both more deadly and the fact yeah, that even if even if you have a, even if you have vitality points out the ass. You can still you can still get dropped. Mm-hmm. Well, not exactly. It's more like uh, you know, D and D also have somewhat uh, uh, a death threshold, but the tre- the death threshold in D and D is exactly your hit points uh, below zero. Mm-hmm. So if you if your if your character gets to zero hit points, then to die on the spot. You have to take a lot of damage, you know. Instead, in D&D, in, in Farsight, the, the mage threshold is all the same. Mm-hmm. From first level to 20. So, let's say, if your uh, character has a death threshold of uh, 15, if you are at zero hit points and you take 15 damage, you die on the spot. Mm-hmm. So this is the the difference. The right. difference. Uh, as a bit of an as a bit of an aside, given given stuff like that and the and the uh, high da- and the high damage of weapons, as well as the way talents work and the way the classes designs work, I'm a bit curious if you guys ever dipped into Star Wars Saga Edition at one point. I I know it, but I never played it. All right, I'll. I guess I can chalk that kind of thing up to up to coincidence. It's just some, it's just something mm. that I spot that I spotted when I looked at when I looked at the class setup on your guys' website. Um, there is one there is one there is one avenue when it came to Cyanix that I did want I did want to cover. Um, now obviously magic is divided into magic in D and D was divided into the nine spheres: enchantment, evocation. Uh, if you get the idea, yes. um, with in your case, you guys have six disciplines, and exactly. I think w- I think with with a fair few of them, what it what it actually does is going to be self explanatory, especially if you've dipped into mm-hmm. science fiction in any form. But there's a few yeah. that I th- I think may not immediately translate to people, and mm-hmm. I'd like to go over those. Yeah. Okay, um, the t- the two the two in that regard are. Metabiosis and meta reality. Exactly, <laughs> I knew it. So metabiosis is all the things that, um, uh, come si dice, mm, che interessano. Uh, the, that, uh, yeah, that interact, that work, that uh, concern. Mm? Yeah, uh, with the uh, with the body of the. Um, and the physiology and the metabolism of the creatures. Mm-hmm. So, if you want to uh, heal a creature, it's a metabiosis power. Mm-hmm. Or if you want to inflict some kind of illness, or to or to change the the physical capabilities of a, a character or the, or a creature, this is uh, 
the stuff that you do with uh, metabiosis uh, powers. Mm -hmm. And then meta reality uh, is um, all the things that um, um, that manipulate the the fabric of reality itself. So um, let me say teleportation mm -hmm. or something like uh, manipulate gravity or uh, uh, mm, let me say, uh, I try to remember, or create a little singularity, mm -hmm. something like that. So you, um, you manipulate space-time in a way mm -hmm. with the uh, meta reality, yes. And then there is uh, uh, telepathy and uh, uh, clairvoyance and other uh, classical stuff, let me say. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to when it comes to the world of um, Farsight, um, would it be mm -hmm. fair would it be fair of me to say that that one of the major themes you get you guys have is a bit of a bit of that frontier kind of mentality? What with what yeah, with absolutely. what with the presence of the um, of the of the out of the of the reflourishing arts outskirts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the um, let me say a thing. The the core book of the game are essentially the game. Mm -hmm. So there is not a lot of of lore stuff in the in the core book. It's like uh, let me say like the uh, the basic uh, the basic D and D um, manual. Would you say it's like yeah, actually? More, would you say it's more like a gazetteer? Would you say the lore part is more like a gazetteer? <laughs> Uh, but actually, the the whole uh, the whole game was born. Uh, we we didn't plan to come up with a universe, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, with lore or anything. We wanted to give uh, just uh, a system, a gaming system that could be used to play science fiction or cyberpunk or modern or just with that vibe. Mm -hmm. But then slowly, we obviously we came up with some races with some, I mean, alien species, and. Um, and from that point on, we we thought, how come? Let's just come up with some story. Let's just put this whole, you know, system, this whole mechanics we got. Let's just put them in a universe. But it's it's really not mm, necessary. We have different uh, inspiration for for the world. Uh, they're very different. Yeah, we we always you know started from the idea of what is uh, space. I mean, the unknown, mm -hmm. the the beyond uh, something that's totally at the same time you know fascinating and uh gives that you know captivating but at the same time it's terrifying it's dark and it's unknown and who knows what's uh beyond space and time in that darkness uh we started from that feel and we we wanted to come up with something real space opery. Uh, so we ended up with a lot of lore in yeah. reality, but we decided to split up a, a little bit. So we have the core book that is the game itself, and then exactly uh, with our with our Kickstarter campaign, we unlocked a second book in which we put all the lore stuff, all the um, the campaign setting, in a sense, and then uh, the adventure and all so on. So you have the second book that contain all the uh, the campaign setting, uh, the basic campaign setting of Farsight. Because that obviously, was... yeah, the game was born with a setting. Uh, when we were in our room um, coming up with ideas and stuff, but we ne we were not sure to have a product with a setting, you know? Mm -hmm. So we decided to keep them divided. Uh, also because I think Farsight is a, is a system that can be used, as I said before, for for a lot of different settings. I mean, we have some friends that are trying to using are using it to play in a Herbert Dune type of setting. Mm -hmm. We have played Cyberpunk with it. Uh, what else? Mm, I mean, I'm quite sure you can play Star Wars with it. But... Mm, but it was not, you know, we didn't want to come up with a game with with a setting. Of course, when you when you think about mechanics, when you think about characters, when you think about 
PCs. I mean, for a person like me, it's inevitable to come up with stories. But we weren't sure till the very end if those stories would end up in our product. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the campaign was a great success. And so we we decided to to use that success to give more, mm, yeah, more flavor mm -hmm. to it. And I, I can I can certainly I can certainly see that. I'm curious I'm curious if um if the full book will have will have anything on um on bi on building ships and po and possibly space combat or if that's that's mm. a more long term. There thing. is a, there is there is a, a whole chapter of the core book that is dedicated to vehicles and uh, starships. Mm -hmm. So you have um, I think. A fairly simple system to um, to create any kind of starship, I think, and of course uh, some rules to um, uh, to run uh, um, starship combat uh, and chases and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I do think it'd be funny if somebody did if somebody did a hack of Traveler using the system you guys have set up. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm not I going to do it. it. I'm not going to do it personally because that because if I start going down the tr if I start going down the traveler rabbit hole again, I'm never coming back. Yeah, exactly. I mean, why would you yeah, do I something know. like that? Yeah. I love traveler. I love. I love traveler. I um, I when I hit when I hit when I hit my subscriber milestone, I had I had said I had <laughs> said that I would I had said that I would review it, and I I put it up to what version. I'm glad. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that my audience chose Mongoose Mongoose Second because I was afraid that they were gonna ch that they were gonna pick one of the earlier editions just to screw with me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. So, you know, Traveler is one of the reason I started to think about mm -hmm. because I love sci-fi mm -hmm. and but I know. I mean, Traveler is what uh, a. A 1972 game, so uh, uh, 50 or 40 or 50 years old game, and I I, I needed to to have uh, I don't know a more modern uh, sci-fi game with the same uh, vibe. Let me say. And then Forsyth was born. <laughs> and for what it's worth, um, 1977, uh, 72 would have meant it, would have meant that it that would have it would have predated D and D, which. Okay. 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 <laughs> yes. 77. Um, but when when I had cut when I had covered Mongoose Second, I had to try and I had to try and summarize all the different additions that Traveler has had over over the years. Yeah. Um, and and let's and let's be honest, a a um. Um, tra Traveler using farce using using the Five E Evolved setup wouldn't be the first time that it had been system hopping. It's done that, it's done that like four or five times over over the last thirty years. Yeah, um, with different success, but yeah. Yeah, all well, well, there's pro there's probably someone out there who like who who likes their graphing calculated enough to do GURPS Traveler. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, yeah. Look, I I love GURPS, but the facts are the facts. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but I think those systems, you know, it, uh, we came up with this with a game like Farsight also because we would like to introduce some new people to the hobby. We have a lot of newcomers when we go to game cons because most of the people say, "Oh, you, it's like Dungeons and Dragons." No, we actually do science fiction. Oh, wait, you do science fiction? Let me sit. Let me try. Mm -hmm. It's something different. Something that people that are not really usually into board games are interested in and are are feeling and would like to try and getting them to to know role playing games with systems that are uh you know much complicated nah yeah just uh yeah they come from another time i think the we require uh a different approach mm -hmm. to newcomers today which is not that doesn't have to you know ruin or spoil the game in any way but it can just be elegant enough to be explained in a few minutes mm -hmm. and pretty enjoyable to be played for years. Now, 
what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window for Farsight? Oh, well, uh, for the PDF version, mm -hmm. I think... Uh, Oh, uh, the Italian one will we will be ready? I think uh, in January or February at least, and the English uh, soon after. Mm -hmm. For the printed version, I think a little bit longer. I think this um, realistically this spring. Yeah, a lot of stuff changed uh, since we did the campaign. This whole uh, printing thing, you know, that was that was the goal, and we're we're studying the situation. But the the PDF version will be ready for the first quarter of, surely first quarter of uh, twenty twenty two. Mm -hmm. And I, I will certainly I will certainly be looking forward to it because well. I um I know that I know that at least one at least one of my players will want will want to want to play the demolitions guy again. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 kind, the kind of person who be who believes that a wall is just a door with a different kind of key. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. Well, and the and the person who who um in order in order to in order to stop in order to try and stop an invading force decided I need landmines. I mean. You need a dozen or so? No, I need crates. I need <laughs> I need fifteen dozen crates of landmines. Yeah. <laughs> because oh, because we are going because we are going to teach the enemy how to fly. We're not going to teach them very well because they're get because they're going to be going splat. But we're going to teach them how to fly. <laughs> oh. But with all with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank both of you for. Taking the time out of your schedule to come on to come into my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Well, okay. thank you for for having us, and thank you for I mean, for your hospitality at your temple. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Yeah, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Oh.